Good morning, everyone. Um, I realize as you're turning in, tuning in to the service, this is going to seem a little odd uh, to start, but we had major technical difficulties today. Cameras turning themselves on and off, uh, software programs shutting down, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we do have portions of the service. This is a uh, a screenshot from part of the video that we got. And uh, if I do this, there I am. Uh, but unfortunately, um, we have some sound, but not all sound. We have some video, but not all video. So you're going to get sort of uh, the best that we can do for this morning, including this uh, particular introduction. So um, we hope that you will still hear the word of God and feel the presence of Christ with you. Uh, even through the uh, technical issues that seem to be part of everyday life these days. So, welcome to worship from Central Lutheran Church, and uh, God bless this time of worship for you. So, our service begins with the uh, confession and forgiveness. Um, it will be up on the screen here, no doubt, shortly. And um, it's also... Uh, available online if you'd like to follow along. Um, you can put the Zoom on one side of your computer screen and open the worship folder on the other side of your computer screen if you know how to do double windows that way and have it available, but here it is. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Lord, on earth and peace on earth be given. Let angels sing, let all reply. Goodwill breaks forth from heaven. Let us pray. O God, rich in mercy, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world and rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us into your light, that all our deeds may reflect your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Numbers. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness, where there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food? Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze, and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. The psalm will be spoken responsively by verse. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, for God's mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that God redeemed them from the hand of the foe. Gathering them in from the lands, from, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took rebellious paths. Through their sins they were afflicted. They loathed all manner of food and drew near to death's door. Then in their trouble they cried to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. You sent forth your word and healed them and rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your, one, and your wonderful works for all people. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell your deeds and shout of joy. A reading from Ephesians. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel according to John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the servant, serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it, it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we have before us this Sunday one of the most, perhaps the most, iconic verses in Scripture, John 3.16. Now, similar to approaching the Christmas Eve gospel, the question inevitably becomes, how do I preach this in a fresh way? Or even, is there anything new I could possibly say? Perhaps one way to approach this question is to allow some of the surrounding verses to take center stage for a change. Or more importantly, perhaps by paying closer attention to the surrounding verses, we might hear and understand John 3.16 more fully and deeply. So in that spirit, here are a couple of things I found easy to overlook about the larger passage that help us hear the gospel more fully in the world's most famous verse. So first off, it's about the cross, but not the cross as we usually think of it. If you wonder why we've got John 3.16 among the impressive collection of Johannine texts that fill out Lent in the year of Mark, it's because of verse 14. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now this somewhat semantic reference to the cross qualifies the rest of the passage for our Lenten consideration. It's all well and good, perhaps, except that it's very easy to read John's testimony through everything else that we know, or at least think that we know, about the cross, rather than to let these words, these verses, speak for themselves. So first of all, note that the reference moves both forward and backward. Not only does the lifting up anticipate Jesus' coming crucifixion, that is, looking forward, but also references the story shared in the appointed first lesson from Numbers chapter 21. In that passage, God, weary beyond belief at the grumbling of the thankless Israelites, sends an exodus-like plague of venomous snakes to chastise them. It is, to say the least, effective. And when the people repent, the Lord commands Moses to make a bronze snake and to lift it up on a pole so that whenever someone is bitten, he or she can look to the snake and be healed. Now, to look ahead to Jesus' lifting up through the lens of this story, the cross is not so much about punishment or payment, but healing, and only healing. As the venomous snakes make the deadly consequences of sin manifest, and the bronze snake offers only life, we might similarly conclude that the consequences of sin abound in our lives, while the cross itself is the agent of our salvation and our healing. Second, lifting up in John has a double meaning. It is indeed the physical elevating of Jesus on the cross, but it's also a metaphorical elevating of just what is happening on the cross. That is, the cross in John is not Jesus' moment of humiliation or defeat or abandonment, as in Mark and Matthew in particular. But rather, for John, this is the moment of Jesus' greatest glory, 
his elevation as he achieves the mission for which he's been commissioned and sent. You can picture this in the fact that John is the only one who records the crucifixion words, it is finished or it is accomplished. Jesus is elevated both physically and metaphorically so that the whole world can see that God's great act of redemption and healing, that moment when the giving of the Son is spoken of in 316, this is where it's made manifest. Again, in John, there's no mention of punishment or payment for sin, as the cross is not a mechanism that effects salvation, but it is the sign that reveals God's love for the wayward world, or the cosmos, or creation, the world in John. Second, Nicodemus doesn't get it, until he does. Both parts of that statement are crucial to hear. Nicodemus, a teacher of the law, a religious authority, curious and open-minded enough to seek out this young rabbi, Jesus, just doesn't get it. He's confused about what it means to be born anew or born again or born from above, and he eventually fades from the scene, returning to his official role and life. In fact, if we were to judge Nicodemus at this point in the story, our verdict would likely not be positive. He meets Jesus, he talks with him, he gets to hear the gospel in a nutshell, and yet can't seem to shake his old ideas or his old practices. And so it doesn't appear that he comes to faith. What a sharp contrast to the next chapter, when a character as polar opposite to Nicodemus as we can imagine, the Samaritan woman at the well, changes her entire life when she meets Jesus and immediately brings others to meet him as well. At this point in the story, Nicodemus is no shining example of the power of the gospel. But if we read further, Nicodemus appears again, this time in the light of day, to claim Jesus' dead body and along with Joseph of Arimathea to give him a proper burial. This is important because this reminds us that there is no single timeline, no single point in a life of how people respond to the good news. Further, it might caution us against judging people for their lack of response to the gospel, for to do so is perhaps not simply to judge others, but indeed to judge God's ability to continue to be at work in the life of those God has called. We confess regularly that the Holy Spirit is at work in the lives of everyone whom God loves. And so we try to discourage ourselves from judging people at any point in their journey because God continues to work. Our job is to testify, to bear witness to the light. And we place the responsibility for salvation on the broad shoulders of the Holy Spirit. Finally, judgment, as it turns out, is about telling the truth. The Greek word krisis, translated here as judgment, refers less to the rendering of a sentence than it does a separating and revealing. The words verdict or decisive moment might be closer, or even an uncovering or a disclosure. That emphasis might help us hear the verses after 316 as more descriptive than accusatory. Those who believe that God is love are saved. They look to the one lifted up for healing. But those who cannot imagine that God comes bringing love rather than punishment are, are simply lost, lost to their despair, sin, and confusion. The verdict, if you will, the conclusion or the revelation is indeed that we love darkness more than light. It's hard to imagine God being any different than we are. We don't want to admit our need and receive God's grace and forgiveness. There is something in us that fears being exposed and perhaps we assume rejected or perhaps even scarier, transformed. Crisis is the root of our word crisis, as it sounds, in the sense of a decisive turning point. God's mercy made manifest in the lifting up of the sun, 
the visible sign of God's grace poured out for the world, creates for us a crisis, a turning point, a decisive moment that we might perceive and receive God's redemptive, life-changing love. Now, with those three elements in mind, hear and proclaim this word of gospel once again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Amen. With the church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. On this fourth Sunday in Lent, let us pray to our loving God for all the needs of the world, responding to each petition with the words from today's psalm, your mercy endures forever. O oh God, preserve your church through good times and bad. Empower pastors, missionaries, young adults in global mission, and all ministries of service for their work throughout this pandemic. Bless Lutherans around the world, our ecumenical partners, and everyone preparing for baptism at Easter. O oh God, our Redeemer, receive our prayers. Your mercy endures forever. Continue your creation of this good earth. Nourish seas and rivers, and give water to thirsty lands. Nurture spring growth that feeds hungry creatures, and bless the fields being prepared for the growing season. O God, our creator, receive our prayers. Your mercy endures forever. In Brazil and wherever COVID-19 rages, send healing. In Myanmar and wherever ty tyranny rules, restore, restore human rights. In Nigeria and wherever there is domestic terrorism, send concord. In Ethiopia and wherever there is bloodshed, bring peace. In Yemen and wherever people starve, give food and water. In the United States and wherever there is discrimination, inspire all residents to honor one another and to strive for justice. Prosper the work of those who care for victims of violence and grant legislators wisdom in decision-making. O oh God, our protector, receive our prayers. Your mercy endures forever. Give rest and welcome to migrants. Bring runaways to places of safety. Protect all who are incarcerated. Provide caring families to children who seek adoption. Give a decent life to all who live on our streets. O oh God, our homeland, receive our prayers. Your mercy endures forever. As you saved your people of old from snakebite, so now deliver all who suffer from disaster, hunger, disease, and despair. And those we name here before you, Brian Alm, Kay Anderson, Richie Caldwell, Walter Kawa, Kathy Phillips, Sharon Smith, Waylon Steiner, Don Tulak, and all those we name in our hearts. We also pray for the safety and well-being of all service men and women. O oh God, our Savior, receive our prayers. Your mercy endures forever. Shine light into our darkness. Make night into a blessing. And in mercy, hear the prayers of our hearts. O oh God, our friend, receive our prayers. Your mercy endures forever. We praise you for all the saints who have lived and died in Christ, especially Patrick and Joseph. And we remember before you all who have died from COVID-19. At the end, bring us with them into life in your presence. O oh God, our comforter, receive our prayers. Your mercy endures forever. 
To you, O God, our only God, we entrust all for whom we pray. Through Jesus Christ, our loving Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Thank you. Take a moment to share that peace with those with whom you might be worshiping or uh, share a word of peace on the chat on the Zoom. And I uh, just want to take a moment to express my appreciation for sticking with us through this this morning. Um, God's word prevails. Let us pray. God, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone, but with words of grace and life. Bless us and these your gifts, which we received from your bounty. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, O God, creator of heaven and earth. You rescued your covenant people, led them on all their journeys, and taught them by the prophets. You so loved the world that you gave your only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit in this meal and make us one in this community of faith and with your people throughout the world. Glory and praise to you, O God, author of life, word made flesh, power of the Most High, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus draws the whole world unto himself. Come to this meal and be fed. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Now the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Amen. Let us May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as beloved and holy, 
freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you, that you may be a blessing. In the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity, amen. Go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.